My name is Kevin Young, and I'm also introducing Victoria Bioli um, from Deeper. So she is the Innovation Policy and Emerging Technology Lead in, um, in Deeper, uh, and I'm a director here in Deloitte looking after robotics and intelligent automation. We've got a packed agenda for you today. So um, our first speaker will be uh, Rory Allen, a partner in cloud engineering in Deloitte, and he's going to talk to us about cloud adoption and give us an overview uh, and some insights from the markets. Um, following that, we'll be speaking to Gavin Ross, the head of information services at the Department of Transport, and he's going to look. He's going to talk to us about their journey um, using automation uh, this year and last. And then we'll we'll speak with Ian Blackburn, who's the executive cloud strategist at Blue Prism. And he's going to talk to us about accelerating growth with cloud-based intelligent automation. Um, we're going to run these speakers one after another, but if you'd like to ask a question to any of the panelists, you can click on the Q&A button in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen, enter your question, and um, we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So if we can flick on to the next slide, and I'll hand you over to Victoria. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Kevin mentioned, my name is Victoria Yoale. I'm the Innovation Policy and Emerging Tech Lead in the Reform and Delivery Division here in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Um, and I'm just going to give you a brief, a quick background on how RPA, the framework, came about. Um, our Public Service 2020 um, is the framework for development and innovation in Ireland's public service, and it's led by the Public Service Reform Team. Um, at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Our OPS 2020 is constructed around three pillars. So the delivery of our public, um, the delivery for our public, innovating for our future, and developing our people and organizations. Um, the OPS framework focuses on supporting sustainability and continuous improvement to build an, um, a stronger public service and deliver better quality service to the public. The framework emphasizes the importance of digital delivery using data to achieve greater efficiency. The RPA framework emerged as a result. Um, and our role, um, so my team's role is to manage, coordinate, and support the rollout of robotic process um, across the civil and public service. Um, a quick overview of the RPA framework in itself. So um, the, um, the framework was awarded in 2019 to Deloitte Ireland, and they are the single supplier to all civil and public service. And the OGP framework allows public bodies and departments to procure RPA software without the hassle of going through the, you know, the traditional procurement process. Um, the RPA software vendors provided through the framework are Blue Prism, NICE, and UiPath. Um, and just to mention that um, Deloitte um, um, offer a free workshop for those interested in investigating the use of RPA and cloud. Um, they also provide four services um, um, that Deloitte can deliver, and this includes supply, renewal, installation of RPA licenses, the provision of RPA training and development, and proposed RPA software vendor expert technical support, and finally, the provision of RPA and RPA-related um, consultancy services. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank um, Kevin and the Deloitte team in putting this um, webinar together. Um, I'm pretty much excited to hear, you know, to learn more about the cloud and automation and um, using the cloud. And I'm sure many of us here today, we have um, many questions as to, you know, what is the cloud? Um, you know, a bet I hope to get a better understanding of what the cloud is and how it works. I'll pass you on to Kevin. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks very much. Many of you on the call um, will have come across robotics process automation before, but we said we'd just do a very quick overview of what it is, right, just for people who haven't come across it before. Um, robotics process automation is an enterprise software tool which automates business processes by mimicking human behavior. So uh, by, by adding a bot to your team, you're adding a, a new member to the team who can, who can mimic your, your human team members um, via software tools, which interact with the, with the various software packages you use every day to get your job done. Um, 
the, the, the sort of advantage of this is you, you can improve the quality of your citizen and or employee experience. You, you can add security, traceability, um, bots can run 24 uh, seven and you can get extra, qual extra quantity through, you know, reducing your backlogs, increasing your capacity by adding this extra software bot to your team. Uh, it can improve quality and, quality and accuracy. Uh, it scales so you can add more bots as, as, as you're, you have more demand. And uh, a bot can typically work at a, an increased speed in terms of uh, what a human would work at. We apply a number of factors for identifying suitable processes, but uh, typically uh, the prerequisites are you have an already existing digital process, which is very heavily rules based. So, you know, um, each employee follows the same set of rules to process it through the system. Uh, the, the case is very much enhanced uh, if you have high volumes. You know, even they can be seasonal or or otherwise um, low variability. So not a lot of uh, errors or, or sort of uh, variability to the process. Um, and, and actually, where where processes are error prone to to human error, uh, it's a really good uh, it's a really good example that a bot can help because they do, they do sort of um, uh, they do uh, really good um, non error proof work, right? So. Um, so flicking over to uh, the, the first speaker then, we're going to introduce uh, Rory Allen, who's a partner here in Deloitte Cloud Engineering. Uh, welcome Rory, and over to you. Thanks for being Kevin. Um, thanks everybody for your time. Uh, delighted of an opportunity. Uh, being transparent, I'll probably struggle to do justice uh, to cloud in 10, 15 minutes, but also recognizing that there's a broad, um, spectrums of kind of experience in terms of I'm sure many on the phone ha, are adept with cloud and uh, have used it and others are maybe kind of exploring it and considering it so I'll try to move at some pace to maybe touch across a couple of things just to open up as well as look cloud is not just another buzzword it's a bit tongue-in-cheek because obviously uh, it is a buzzword and nearly every word on this slide I've used is is our buzzwords but look there is a lot of reality a lot of value a lot of impact behind that buzz you could easily change cloud out for technology and that would probably give you a easier sense of how broad a topic it is how um, much how much kind of spectrum of services the different ways you can buy those services is really kind of infinitum in terms of how you configure it so when we look at it you know and top down from kind of the business side of cloud what is it well it is an enabler ultimately we don't see any business change in the modern world without technology change. And we are fast heading towards a world where there will be very little technology change without cloud involved in some form. That doesn't mean we won't continue to have our own data centers. We won't be hybrid. But look, cloud will feature more and more. And look, we're seeing that globally. And I'll touch on the trends in a minute. It's a paradigm shift. What we mean there is, look, it's a new way of thinking. You have to you work slightly different. See how you implement cloud is different. The skills you need are different. But also... The fact that it's a different model, more option in terms of how you assemble and configure it means you need to think about it differently as a business to unlock the value. It should and is a core element of many strategies. So if you have a business strategy, you have an IT strategy, you should and likely have a cloud strategy underpinning that, but that needs to be continually fed and watered. Kind of the bottom term is kind of an endless array of capabilities. And unfortunately for Kevin and some of the light team, they've probably seen the three hour version of this presentation. But look, this is where you get into like the evolution of cloud and all the various things you can draw down from it as a service. The history of cloud is really interesting to kind of set out as, you know, like all great innovation, when you step back from it, it's really quite a logical idea. Pool resources, make them the best resources you can and then share them. Well, ultimately, that's what the cloud providers have done. Rather than having one data center, have countless data centers all across the globe, connect those, then enable a set of capabilities that you can access anywhere in the world on a rental basis. Now, what's happened, that started out as I could buy some compute, I could buy some storage. Then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, well, everyone's using the database. Maybe we don't give them the server to run the database. Maybe just give them the database, which is where platform was born out of. Well, actually, everybody needs a CRM system. Everyone needs an email system. Let's do software as a service. And, and it continues to evolve. And we've seen a recent trend where ecosystems are pre-assembled. So not just that you could take your email system, your CRM, your core, maybe financial system individually. 
and you're seeing cloud providers, systems integrators now start to shift into the kind of what we call a vertical world of cloud, where they're starting to pre-configure those to be match industry. So that might be, you know, accelerated ecosystem of tools that would help you answer a healthcare question, may help you answer a um, e-commerce question. And we saw a lot of examples in um, the pandemic, both locally and globally, where that was brought to bear in terms of solving some very time centers and critical challenges. So look, loads of option in terms of what you can assemble and bring it together to deliver the business needs you can. It's exciting in terms of as you adopt cloud, it is different new skills, but it also um, inherently has a lot of very positive things and a security at every level. It's been taught about it from all 360 direction. And, and it encourages you, obviously, you can build things in security and cloud, but it's much harder to do. And you're encouraged in the principle and how you engage with cloud and configure it to be secure by design. It feeds on principles of automation everywhere. So you build your, you build your network and your infrastructure in code, which means you can replicate it, adding servers, adding new locations, whatever it is can be repeated. So it's kind of one click rather than, okay, I have to do a whole hardware provision. And these are all things people are very familiar with, but are very much true when done right. And overall, we look on it as just a massive accelerator. So if you can get it right, you can focus on where the unique value is to your business in a context of intelligent automation and RPA. Really, that's focusing on the press process and the value. I think Kevin put it well, you know, you're adding a new member to your team. Well, like, any member of your team, they need it, you know, they need somewhere to sit, they need to be fed and watered. But the difference with the bot is they need somewhere to sit there digitally. And cloud offers a accelerated way in terms of it's quicker to stand up, it's quicker to scale. You aren't worried about trying to predict your scale in the future. You can start small and grow. So that's just a kind of intentionally buzzy um, touch points across a number of topics related to cloud. Um, I might move on to the next slide and just move across some of the market insights, probably start to touch on there. You know, I suppose the global trend is year on year cloud consumption adoption grows, continues across all industries and all sectors. Ireland is not unique in that. We've recently run a cloud index survey within Deloitte across 101 C-suite, um, both public and private sector. And we can see that trend um, continue um, 54% of organizations are at scaling phase, 20 are already in production, and ev nearly everyone at that is exploring. So you kind of have that 100% penetration around, we're looking at it, we're thinking about it, or we're already on the journey. Interestingly, kind of the biggest barriers continue to be kind of sponsorship, you know, a little bit of fluency, a little bit of an understanding of business case, the availability of skills, because cloud is different and tech, tech skills are in short supply and hard to get. And what's interesting within the findings is actually the public sector comes out with all the same shared um, concerns and kind of considerations, but just a slightly different prioritization. Um, and within the public sector, I think, you know, security, data residency um, continue to be a kind of a top priority and rightly so considering the nature of the data stored. But look, strides are being made all the time to help streamline that effort. You know, it, it's a joint technology and process and regulation um, challenge. So overall, I think where we do see a lot of correlation between private, public and all sectors is the main reasons and the kind of leading initial reasons for cloud adoption. Data, data analytics, intelligent automated, in, internet of things are top of the list. And they're, to be honest, AI and data, especially AI, if you want to really turn the dial on the intelligence side of intelligence automation, cloud really is the answer. Now that doesn't mean you can't do it if you have concerns about data residency, et cetera. That just means you need to think about how you would do it in terms of you may not want your data to reside in the cloud, but you may be comfortable temporarily putting it in there to process it, to get an intelligent answer and never persist the data. So you see different kind of data management strategies in a cloud and a hybrid context that can help unlock those capabilities, which are frankly unique in terms of replicating those on-premise in existing ecosystems is just prohibitively expensive and complex. So I might move on to my last slide, which to be honest, I've probably touched on a number of these already, 
But I think on the left, it's a kind of summarize of the key benefits. I think I've mentioned the analytics and cognitive is really disruptive starting use case. It can be at the heart of core business transformation. We see a number of examples across Europe where in tech modernization programs in the UK and wider, it's at the core of that transformation in public sector. Um, speed and agility, you know, it's 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 there, it's ready to go, you just need to draw down on it. Now look, the reality of it is it's not that easy, which links to some of the challenges on the right, where you're kind of getting the right policies, security measures in place, getting access to the people, getting your organization fluent in cloud so they understand where best to use it, then having the right skills to implement it in the right way, and being able to continue that journey so that as you invest in cloud, that you are able to move at that higher pace. Procurement sits there, you know, it is a it is a different way, a different service that needs to be cured in its appropriate way. And there are some, I suppose, elements to it which prove challenging but can all be overcome and deeper have made great strides in, in helping with that in terms of, you know, it is a, a big service provider, but you know, the, the structures are there to help with that. I think one of the big things in parallel to the right technology skills, there is a new element when you get into it, which we call kind of the cloud business office or it could be the cloud center of excellence or your cloud operations team. The management of it switches from, you know, you're not procuring software and buying hardware every three, five, seven, ten 10 years. It's month on month. It's more like the, home, the phone bill at home or the electricity bill at home. You kind of need to be saying, look, if we spend too much, why? You know, chasing people to turn off the lights at home is the same as chasing people to turn off servers at nighttime if they're not utilizing them. So you need that skill set alongside the technical skill set. With look, is all very solvable challenges, um, and and very much we can see from the data and the survey where people have wrestled those, made the investment, they are realizing the benefits, but it does take time and effort and a focus and and needs a good plan. So look, that was my very quick, I'm gonna hand over to Gavin now, but I um, will take any questions at the end and welcome them. And obviously if people want the three hour version or anything in between, I'd be happy to connect directly and see what you can facilitate. Over to you, Gavin, thanks. Great, thanks Rory. Um, and listen, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, and thanks everyone for organizing this. Um, I'm just gonna give you a, a quick run through. I love to myself and Gavin Ross, head of head of the information services division to organize transport. I'm gonna give you a quick overview of kind of our journey so far over the last kind of year or so with RPA and the background and run through a few use cases that hopefully kind of bring it to life a little bit um, for everybody. So just move on to the next slide, please. Looking just a little bit of background, first of all, I was I joined the public sector just at the end of 2020, so about a year and a half or so in now. I've been originally exposed to RPA in my previous role uh, in Three Ireland. We had started to, to um, implement it and I kind of see the, the potential that was there. When I joined the department, I was kind of keen to carry that through because I'd seen, I'd seen it had a huge many applications. Uh, and we were already using it in the department family. Uh, the Road Safety Authority were using it extensively to manage, you know, huge volumes of driving theory tests and, and actual uh, driving tests themselves huge number of kind of cancellations and stuff that came out of COVID and they had really ramped up their RPA extensively to kind of handle that volume and it had really done well for them. And it just it supports the, the wider innovation um, agenda in government. Uh, I have to say the, the framework that Victoria referenced at the start really did help having that in place where you had kind of a, a pre-select set of products, uh, implementation partner, uh, prices, ways of working, you know, you weren't having to kind of go and reinvent the wheel yourself really did help lower the barrier to entry for us and allowed us to kind of hit the ground running a lot faster than if you were to kind of you know start from scratch so i think that framework really really helped um, us on our journey uh, it also does also include elements of training to allow you to provide an rpa training for your staff if, if that's something that, you, that that people are interested in we did the business analyst training in terms of how to scope out a journey as to whether it be suited to rpa um, and the robot controller training in terms of how to run the bots and kind of do you know basic troubleshooting or basic monitoring of them and uh, we didn't go for the full developer training which is a bit more involved in terms of actually building the flows uh, and the model we're following at the moment is just kind of we have some some team some of our staff in it shadowing deloitte learning the ropes learning how, how the, the flows work um, and just you know to upskill ourselves and become more self-sufficient over time uh, we did start obviously you'll start with kind of the low-hanging fruit the simpler tasks 
we did a full kind of sweep of the, 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 the usual candidates within departments, things like finance, HR, areas like that, that tend to have uh, flows that suit RPA. So we certainly, I'm gonna walk you through a few here. We start with some smaller ones, really to give ourselves a chance to kind of understand how the process works, understand how RPA works, how the projects themselves work, uh, and also to get staff uh, engagement and sponsorship, you know, to kind of get, you know, a few people in to go, look, this, this worked really well and, and to help, you know, sell it to other people. So you get this kind of build up this roadmap and you, and you get it kind of people coming to you then looking to automate tasks. Uh, and that, that really worked quite well for us as, a, as an approach. I have to say, you know, we've had a really positive response from staff. I mean, I think sometimes it can be a fear that RPA is there to kind of, you know, take parts of people's roles away that they might've been doing for years. So I can honestly say the, the elements of people's roles we've taken, they were very happy to see off their plate. Some of them were, and I'll, I'll talk you through a few, you know, quite repetitive, tedious type roles, to be honest, a lot of Excel, a lot of really hard to, I mean, if anyone who's looked at a thousand row Excel sheet and tried to match figures and, and, and you know, accurately, as, as Kevin said earlier on, you know, it's, it's tough and, and it's, you know, a repetitive task that, we, you know, they were really happy to see off their plate and allows them time to focus on, you know, more value added tasks that are that better utilize their own experience and their own learnings um, as people, you know, and let the bot do that kind of heavy lifting side on, on, on repetitive tasks. Uh, and just one example, I was just talking to someone last week just to kind of get some kind of, you know, box box for this session. Uh, and one of the candidates said, look, she had spent 12 hours on her part of the flow and that's down there to 30 minutes, you know, just in terms of spot checking stuff. So she saved, you know, 96% of her time back to focus on other parts of her job, which is fantastic. And uh, I might just click on the next slide, please. So look, I mean, in terms of the cloud element, just briefly, the, the approach we took is kind of a hybrid cloud um, model. So basically what this means is we have the UI path orchestration. UI path is, is the, the RPA uh, product we use. And um, it's, it's in the cloud and it's the one that kind of, you know, monitors and, and does controls the actual flow and what's happening. It allowed us by having that in the cloud, we didn't mean we didn't have to go and buy and, and set up, you know, a high-end kind of application server on premises. Um, and then it then can communicate with some virtual machines which are on our which are on prem for us. And thus means we can keep any of the actual data processing of our own data as all kept within our own network. So there's no you know worries or concerns around information passing out from our network. Um, all the bot does is you know control from a log perspective of the work that's being done. Uh, so it was just a, it was a flexible model for us uh, to get, get, get the get the best of both worlds, keep the data on premises, but have it faster to set up by having that orchestrator in the cloud uh, and very kind of scalable. I think it was a good model for us. I mean, you know, I think the cornerstone of the cloud is that it's very scalable, it's very agile, very quick to set up rather than you know building stuff yourself. And um, might just touch on the next slide, please. So to run through all these, you know, we're going to send these slides out after the session. But these are the four processes that we've automated to date over the last nine months or so. Um, the low value purchase cards, I talked talk about there's two elements of a motor tax receipt reconciliation process. And then the one I talked about just for a few minutes is the licensed haulier emergency support scheme. So we might just click on to the next slide, please. Um, so this, I chose this one as kind of topical, I suppose you may all have heard that there was a government scheme recently launched to provide financial assistance to the haulage industry, basically uh, truck truck drivers and, and, and firms with, with, with uh, haulage equipment to help offset the huge increase in fuel prices that, that we've seen for arise from various events recently. Um, this came to us as a kind of a, a quick initiative that we need to suddenly make happen. Um, and just to give a, a flavor of what's done here, I mean, there's about three and a half thousand licensed hauliers in the country, we need to go out to all of those haulers. They need to send us back and apply for this scheme, send us back various pieces of information. So we were able to set up a bot very quickly that monitors a dedicated mailbox for us. It sees all the incoming e emails. It checks if the email is coming from the email that we sent out the, the invite to, to stop, you know, kind of people trying, ch chancing their arm effectively of, of, of trying to put in an application for this. So there's, there's that initial little bit of validation. Once that's checked, it can open the email, it can check if it's the right attachments, there's some declarations in there. There's also an Excel sheet with information from the haulier. It can open that Excel sheet, it can check the data in it. Is it complete? Is it the right format? If it's not, if there's stuff at the wrong format or if there's stuff missing, 
the bot can automatically list those, put them into an email, and email the whole of your back automatically to say, thank you for your application, you know, but you're missing, you know, item one and item seven and item nine. Please resubmit your application with this missing information. That comes back in. We check it again. Once that application is, is, is verified and complete, it can then feed into a master file. There's some checks there around tax clearance certificates um, and, and, and payment files that can then allow us to create the hauliers as payees in our regresso financial system. The bot can output the files required to set them up. It can then output files required to make payments from aggresso. Um, so it really, you know, it, it, it took a huge, you know, burden off this process, which kind of has to be set up very quickly. And uh, I think it's just uh, trying to bring it to life a little bit. So the type of tasks you can you can apply a bot to. And um, so just might click on to the next one, please. And um, just briefly, the low value purchase cards. This is the first one we did. So this is the low hanging fruit. So this is one of the financial tasks. And um, the, the department has about 90 or so credit cards, mostly used by Coast Guard volunteers. The Coast Guard comes under the remit of the Department of Transport. And um, they use these credit cards to buy fuel for their vehicles, emergency vehicles that might go out to rescues um, and other incidentals. But obviously all of that has to be accounted for and vouched for. So every month there's 90 credit card bills that come into us. And then there's 90 sets of, of, of receipts that are submitted by the people. Again, a huge manual process of checking one against the other. We set up a bot that looks at the receipts and checks at the receipts against the bill, see if there's any missing or unrecognized uh, transactions, emails the person back to go, you're missing a receipt for this transaction or that transaction, or this is an unrecognized transaction. Can you, can you explain this? You know, can, can put certain ones aside for human intervention if, if it doesn't, you know, if there's something in there that seems unusual. But again, really, you know, for the vast majority of these, they are basically straightforward processes. And it, it took a huge, element of, of, of effort off uh, of people who were able to do this. Um, and, and it was a really good, good, good starting point for us. And that kind of flowed into other ones. Um, I might just flick on. I'll flick on through quickly through these last two. These are just two around, again, one part of the thing is the, the motor tax process around just motor tax offices all around the country. There are daily payments that they submit into the department and there's huge reconciliation of bank lodgements versus what they say is lodged and a lot of work there. And um, one of these processes is going to save a full FTE equivalent once we have it all up and running. Um, so it's just, there's two, two sides saying, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you going kind to of read through those. And like, I'm happy to kind of take questions or have a session after this with anyone who wants to follow up or ask any more about these use cases if they want. And um, let's click on to the next slide, please. And just one more. So look, I suppose the lessons learned, I suppose what really struck me was I think when people look at RPA, sometimes they look at it as that FTE saving bit. But what I call out, I think Kevin referenced this earlier as well. What really, what really is the value for us as well is the accuracy and the, 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 the speed that this, these bots can work at. You know, we can now run processes much more frequently uh, with a much higher degree of accuracy. You know, with the best will in the world, you know, there's, there's human error um, and to a greater level of granularity than we were before. You know, the bots are able to take in more inputs. To, to check more things than just we were able to do as as, as a human human done process. So you know it's it's created huge benefits from a risk and an audit perspective, which has really been beneficial. Uh, I have to say, look, we've had a great working relationship with Deloitte. So far, you know, we've kept the same team on our side and on their side, and we've really reached a kind of a very good kind of working relationship and cadence with them, you know, working together. I think that's really been a very successful relationship uh, and has highlighted us to kind of really build up a great, a great reputation for RPA in the department. And now we have other teams coming to us and other, you know, asking, can you now do this process, can you do that process for us? And um, we are going to take a little pause this year to look back, you know, just to be sure that the, the process are meeting there, the return on investment in the business case that, that were, was originally envisaged. We already have four or five other business flows already in, in the hopper and more to come. And um, we are exploring elements of, kind of the, the Microsoft Power Platform where a process may not be big enough for, for an RPA, you know, uh, to kind of that, that level beneath us. So there's, there's, there's various tools that can be used. I think RPA is, is good for larger, longer term processes, but the smaller things that we're looking for other tools to do. Um, and look, just in conclusion, I would really recommend anyone who hasn't explored this um, to talk to Deeper, to talk to Deloitte, or talk to myself. I'm happy to chat to anybody. Like I said, you know, there is, there's potential candidates, I say, in, in everybody's department if you haven't tried this. And like I said, the framework that's there really does make it quite accessible. 
and quick to get up and running and, and do some trials, do some proof of concepts and see if it's, if it's for you. So I would encourage everyone to kind of uh, explore it. So that's it for me. I might hand over to uh, Ian from Blue Prism. Thanks, everyone. Great, thanks for that. Um... Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to take you through uh, a, a slightly different different view of how we see accelerating growth by choosing intelligent automation. And this is cloud-based. So I'll hit you with a stat first off. So 85% of organizations are going to be embracing a cloud-first principle by the end of 2025. But a lot of them won't fully execute that based on digital strategies without being having or without having a cloud-native architecture and technology there to support it. And that, that's quite game changing, as, as you was, uh, Kevin was saying in the beginning, and Rory was like drawing out. There's some really, really key things there that's going to change the way that business is conducted and it's shifting more and more into cloud. So, you know, 85% is where, where we'll be by 2025. Next slide. And here's some other stats just to throw at you. So, 69% of organizations are selecting process automation or RPA as the key driver for their digital transformation. 79% of executives whose organizations are scaling and using automation expect them to their organization to outperform the competition through the use of that technology. And that's going to give them revenue growth in the next three years. 72% of execs are shortening timelines for implementing digital vision business initiatives. Again, expecting that to be enabled by RPA and cloud technologies. 54% of organizations having four to 10 concurrent automations initiatives underway as, as they were surveyed. So more and more companies are realizing that having intelligent automation there as part of their strategy, as part of their toolkit, is a key enabler of that digital transformation. And they're actually accelerating their intelligent automation efforts, which is really, really key. They're doing that because they can genuinely see the value that they're starting to deliver, either through proof of concepts or actually starting to scale up with now. Next slide. So let's hit you with an example then. So, you know, talk about realizing success in everyday life and improving everyday life. Uh, one of our customers is Suffolk County Council, and we've got a digital workforce there that's helping Suffolk basically improve everyday life for their, their client base. They've got a process that they have uh, basically looked at, which was to do with managing cases to do with childcare and social care. There's obviously a real responsibility to keep sensitive information safe, secure, but it's also got to be shared and used by those organizations to actually you know, use it to deliver the outcome. So Suffolk looked at deploying a uh, Blue Prism digital workforce, and this is based in the cloud. And this is alongside working alongside their uh, local NHS trust. They're now considered one of the pioneers of intelligent automation in the area. And they're helping smaller public sector groups as well, helping them follow suit. And they're providing citizens with you know, expedited services as a result of that. So the case in this one was actually a uh, police welfare process related to childcare. Um, it's now been fully automated. And the referral comes in, digital workers take the data, examine it, load it onto the system, allocate social workers, and work that once took up to a week is now actually completed in less than an hour. That's significantly going to impact the experience of a child, but also the social worker as well. So the comment that we had from Richard, who leads the uh, intelligent automation team there, was, you know, the police welfare system uh, process, it's a critical one because... You know, as he, as he states, it's somebody's mother, father, brother, sister. It's personal. It matters. And so using you know, digital workforces based in the cloud, they're able to receive that support quicker, faster and more resiliently. So that process ended up being 60 percent faster. Um, you know, every referral was completed with 60 percent quicker and within that hour. Um, so significantly different from where they were before. The experience uh, for as a result of that, not just for and from the social workers, but also obviously for the children or the, the adults in, in some cases, significantly improved. And the ability to share data and share data safely and securely using this process, it was it helped them speed up the, the process there. So uh, a really interesting case study that one, um, and you know, really well delivered by the team. We can move on. So. You know, what's the challenge then with delivering you know, cloud-based automation, high-impact intelligent automation? Doing this at speed can be difficult. 
you know, the time to value when you've got limited resources in your organization can, can, be, can be difficult. You know, does your IT team need another IT project to stand up more infrastructure, install software, learn how to configure it, et cetera? You know, there's going to be a challenge around maximizing your return on investment. So speed to value is going to be really, really important here. And by working in a cloud environment, you can actually deploy things faster, quicker, stronger without having to rely too heavily on your IT team. There's often a fairly rapid, uh, more dynamic environment now than you know, many people are used to. That constantly changing set of priorities and the ability and need to be able to flex quickly, adaptively, is, is really, really supported well by having a cloud-based environment. And the other thing, you know, at the end of it, it's going to be cost. You know, high cost, high effort to deploy. You know, once you've got these things, they need looking after, feeding and watering, so upgrading, scaling. It can be a challenge, uh, and there's another way that it can be done, and that's through the use of a cloud deployment strategy. So let's move forward. So for Blue Prism, who obviously I work for, our solution is don't just build it, buy it. Um, what we can offer is a robust digital workforce. It's on a fully managed platform, so we take care of all of the hassle of managing the full stack of software, the infrastructure, the support, and the connectivity. And we support that with a holistic automation lifecycle, working with partners who are gonna be focused on your customer success. So, you know, we'll take care of the platform, the partner takes care of the customer success part. You pay attention to the processes, the bit that's really important and the knowledge that's there to help drive automations. That's where the value lives, not so much in the platform itself, in actually what you do with it. So our, our approach is to help you focus more on using it and less on actually looking after it. Let me just move forward. So the results of this, you can get a faster, lower uh, total cost of ownership by working in the cloud. Obviously, these cloud solutions are built at scale. Therefore, there is a, uh, an economy of scale that goes alongside that. And because it's being done for you by a specialist, they do it all the time. So there's better agility, greater speed. So, for example, a group Blueprint cloud platform can be spun up literally within days. And so you could be you know, accessing stuff relatively quickly. There's a greater workforce optimization and experience because your physical workers, your human workers, have some of those mundane, repetitive tasks taken away from them. And therefore, they can be deployed to much more value-added services. And these are the things that you know digital workers really aren't good at, such as collaboration or you know, empathizing or creative kind of activities that might be required. The customer experience is typically improved by the use of these kind of platforms. So you know, you're looking at availability, speed, speed of response, quality, consistency, you know, error-free, all of the great things that Rory was referring to. And a lot of companies have seen that actually by doing this, or actually the cost of not doing this, is that the market will move forward. So, you know, trust me, you know, there are organizations out there, if you're not doing it, they are. And, you know, they're looking to create that advantage in the market and create a proposition that means that they can do it faster, better, stronger than the next guy. And, you know, and that's why it's becoming more and more of a, a critical string in every, every organization's um, strategy. Let's move forward. And we'll talk about another case study. So we've gone from Suffolk. Let's have a look at the north side then. So Norfolk County Council. Um, now, Norfolk are actually one of our uh, prize winners. They were deemed one of our best newcomers in 2021. Um, they had some interesting challenges in their area where they were looking to help enhance uh, citizen experience using the digital workers. So their social workers were spending a significant amount of their time on administrative chores uh, rather than actually paying attention to their citizens. So each day, for example, the police send uh, a missing children's report into them. A social worker had to match names of those missing children, match it with the case workers, and then they could act quickly and take appropriate action. And that required access to multiple documents, you know, multiple e emails, multiple email chains, and it was taking them roughly on average around 20 hours a month per case. So by automating that, they were able to significantly changed the experience that the citizens were having. At the same time, they also looked at a tax-related payroll process, which was fairly convoluted, time-consuming. I think it had about 30 steps, uh, and that was adding up to 134 hours of extra work per month. So the solution was to deploy a team of Blue Prism digital workers to help staff tackle those significant but repetitive tasks that were there in front of them. And as we stand today, those digital workers are helping to expedite uh, the search for missing children. 
The new process ensures that cases can be investigated quicker in hopes that obviously those children can be found sooner. Um, digital workers are automatically reading those emails, extracting the key information, taking the case, compiling a compact report and presenting that to a case worker in record time. The tax process that was mentioned, um, that's been automated as well. It's now quickly processing data, helping guarantee the employees are paid on time and their taxes are recorded accurately, something obviously that everybody's interested in. And reducing the time to complete that process from what was five days to now it takes place in under two. So the high level metrics you can see on the left hand side there, 133 hours saved per month, and that was just on that payroll process alone. The improved citizen experience through you know, helping track down missing children much quicker. And currently they've got 21 processes live and that's a position that they got to within just eight months. So this is about speed to value. You know, having those tools and the full stack of tools available in a cloud environment means that you can focus on delivery rather than you know, maintaining. And that's what you're seeing there, that accelerated use of intelligent automation. The motto that the guys have got at Norfolk, get it done now. Uh, and you know, Keith McDowell, who's the uh, project manager for RPA there, you know, he's got a great statement there. And he believes that you know, for them, you know, it was really the time to start future-proofing by investing deeper and deeper into automation. If we just move forward. So high-level view then of cloud, and in this case, Blue Prism Cloud. What you're looking at is generating exponential business value. So focusing on the business, unlocking that value and getting higher and higher up the values chain. You're looking at time to value. So the ability to move at speed. So you're not having to invest the time and effort into managing infrastructure or software. If you're going for a software as a solution uh, service kind of approach, then that's taken care of for you. So you can focus on actually using these tools to actually deliver value. They're safe and secure. And we talked about the security and the governance that sits around these platforms. So you can get maximum compliance, great auditability of any processes that you're doing. You've got higher agility because in this case, you know, you get the full Blue Prism suite of software available to you in the cloud rather than just piecemeal adding the components as you might need to. And then the total cost of ownership uh, is typically lower uh, in the cloud, as well as having that, you've obviously got support for that and obviously things like upgrades and maintenance, it's all being taken care of for you. So there's some really significant you know, values that are allowing businesses and operations to start to focus on the delivery, the value add, rather than the technology stack itself. We just move on. So I think that brings us to the end. So I'll hand back to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. And thanks to all the speakers. Um, we have some questions here uh, that I'll ask uh, generally to the panel and, and people can pick them up as they feel fit. So uh, how does a public service organization get started with cloud given the bewildering array of choices in vendors and products? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer that. You pick Blue Prism, obviously, that's clearly the thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> jo joking aside, I think, um, by use of partners like Deloitte, um, you know, there's a, there's a service there that these guys can offer you uh, to help guide you through, you know, what might seem a fairly confusing uh, array of products and services. Uh, so the use of someone like Deloitte can really, really help you. Um, obviously, you can go and do the investigation yourself and, you know, create a little project to go and find out a bit more about it. Most of the vendors have pretty comprehensive uh, websites, case studies and resources available for you. Um, but I would certainly recommend the use of a partner uh, in helping you through that. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the specific challenges for public service and cloud? Um, I can pick, it's probably, you know, yeah. probably interlinked with the first question, Kevin, and look at, you know, I think Ian covered it well, like it does start with fluency, which should kind of lead into ambition. So kind of try to get clear on what you're trying to achieve. So like before you worry about cloud, you're probably worrying about the business outcome and then try to find a way to layer the cloud ambition on that. But look, I think when you get bottom up around what are some of the key challenges, like actually they're common probably outside the public sector. I think, you know, um, making cloud successful, Look, you have to have the leadership buy in that probably goes back to a lot of like making technology programs successful, you know, like having the leadership alignment, having the right vision, 
um, then you get into kind of maybe some cloud specific things. Look, this it's different. You know, it's still technology, but it is different. But to do it well, you need new skills. Obviously, you can build those skills in your own team, but you might need help in the interim. Things like managed service does help. It gets people start started, so you can kind of you know um, consider. Uh, buying it as a service with everything together and then over time maybe bring it back in-house to suit kind of what your own ambition and capability um, procurement because look it's very layered you know trying to procure a cloud service is very hard you know it, it's I think of it as buying a car we're in a modern world where you know t- the difference between Toyota and a, and a um, you know Volkswagen they do the exact same job to get HB or very reliable maybe cost maybe things but actually, if you come up the layer and say, well, actually, can I procure the outcome and maybe either make cloud a consequence of the outcome because someone comes with the solution and cloud's part of it or um, somewhere in between. So I think procurement just needs to be navigated. Um, but again, that's sort of a skill set. And then I think the big thing is that you decide to get there, you get there. It needs to be operated and operated different. So current operations team in IT or current operate partnerships you have for on-premise or infrastructure provider, you will need supplement to that. So look, there's a lot in it, um, but I think it does start with kind of vision, clear on the why, and then start to break down those those building blocks. I might, I might just, just, sorry, yeah. Kevin, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, it's just, it's just one other bit. An easier way to look at it, I suppose, or, or where you're looking at it in some areas is to look at new projects. You know, so look, there's no direction from government of, of a cloud first policy. It's just, you know, that it's cloud and you have to, you have a good reason not to go to cloud. So, you know, people might be sitting there with a huge ecosystem that's all on prem and they go, do you where do I start? We're trying to move this old system onto cloud. Yes, you can do that, but probably an easier way to start is to go, okay, look, projects as, as you launch into new projects going forward this year or next year. They, you know, start for, for them to be on the cloud. And at least that's, you're establishing yourself in there, you're establishing your experience, you're establishing a bit of an ecosystem. And then once you get more familiar with that, you can then look at maybe perhaps your, as you come up with new platforms for renewal to go, okay, look, we'll, we'll leave that platform where it is until it's due to your place or it's due to renewal. And then we'll rebuild that in a cloud environment and approach it that way. I think it's, it's probably a, a manageable approach rather than kind of you know it can be a bit overwhelming if you look at everything all as a totality and go you're not going to move everything to cloud all in one go but you know have a, a cloud policy i suppose and we've developed a cloud policy as well and um, it's also important you know to have guidance for your staff you know it's great from an it perspective sometimes you go okay look we can put everything in the cloud it's very scalable for us we have to be conscious as well when, when your staff are then putting information into that cloud what information are they putting up there so we, we, before we launched into a lot of our cloud policy or a lot of our cloud systems, we, we developed and launched a cloud policy, which is very clear, which we then launched the staff to go, if you're going to use these tools, there are certain criteria and this is what you can put up there and this is what you don't put up there. And this is, you know, the cloud tool that you get has to meet, you know, a lot of criteria from us. But it's very easy for staff to, to sign up, you know, it's very easy to sign up to all these kind of online, you know, tools. That are all cloud based, even you know, even if it's not just an IT project, lot signing up to it. So, you know, a, a cloud policy is important so that you know where you're going as an IT department, and also staff have good clarity as to what how to use these tools in an appropriate way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was I was going to pro- probably build on that. I say, in, interestingly, I think one of the things that I I see, um, and maybe this is more than just public sector, but um, the thing that holds a lot of organisations back is that vision and creativity piece, oddly for a, a piece of technology, is the creative use of that technology is what holds them back. So, you know, you might see people start to look at, oh, you know, a very small process and almost like the ambition is, oh, we'll automate that small process. Actually getting a bit more creative and looking a little bit more visionary is like, why couldn't we automate the whole of that piece of work from end to end? Really starts to transform the way that you look at an organisation and how work gets done. So you know we have we have a concept of a third, a third, a third. So you know a third systems, a third people, and a third RPA, and that's kind of like the direction that it's kind of heading in at the moment. Um, but it's working out how you can apply that to all of your organisation's processes. So weirdly, a creative streak is kind of required for this as well. Okay, thanks, John. Um, how did you identify a good candidate process for RPA in the Department of Transport? 
<clears throat> and yeah, I, I like such for me. Um, look, there's 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 good there's tools you can do, but I think you know initially, I, like I said, we went to work with yourselves, Deloitte, and just our own understanding to go look. What departments have very structures? You know, for for bots to do it right, if, if, if bots don't do particularly well with a lot of you know ambiguous, unclear, I'm not really sure what to do here type stuff. But where look at your at your business and look at at. You know, like I said, it, it does tend to be finance. I think tends to be the the the, the, the initial, you know, really clear um, areas where there's very structured, repetitive, rule based tasks, and um, that are that are structured and, and you know usually Excel based. And, and but I mean the, the bots very able to kind of log into systems and move stuff around and and, and you know query and, and update stuff and put folders and stuff like that. So they're they're very they're very capable, but. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's definitely processes there that everyone would have that are just, you know, quite manual, quite, you want repetitive, so you get the kind of benefit from it. You don't want something that's done once a year or that takes five minutes. So something that kind of takes a bit, fair bit of time, that's very structured in, in sort of rule base that a bot can kind of quickly do. Um, and, and that's what I what I look at. But, 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 you know, there's lots of tools there that can help you identify those. Uh, and then, like I said, once you build up your own kind of sense of it and your experience. A, you as a team will get better at spotting other candidate opportunities. And B, you know, staff will start to kind of chat to each other and go, you know, they, they were able to, to automate this task and that task. And then other people go, well, you know, I have a task that really I hate doing and it's a real pain in the arse and I have to do it every month. And it'd be great if I didn't have to do that. And, and almost the word of mouth helps. And then you've got, you, know, you have to qualify these and sometimes they're, they're not a good candidate, but oftentimes they are. Um, and so look, we, we've got we've got more than enough work to keep it going for another year or more on this, and, and it keeps growing. So I think that's that's where I would I would recommend. Yeah, that that resonates with me, Gavin, because um, in some of our accounts, we've put together teams, including DOT, who actually will reject processes fairly frequently and say this this is just not suitable for RPA, or mm -hmm. you know, it's not suitable for cloud. So yeah, it's a, I think it's a good point. Uh, question here: How is cloud safer in terms of cybersecurity? Probably happy to answer, take a attempt to that one, Kevin. Like, I think, look, there's probably an overarching, like, cloud has to be done right. So, you know, the cloud providers is a shared responsibility model and the cloud provider has part of it. But the, the adopting organization has a lot of responsibility, which includes the, you know, their own data. So, you know, it's important that you understand that. Gavin rightly said you need the right policies around to support that. You need the education within the organization, both on your technology and business side to understand that. But ultimately, if you think about it, it is a little bit of the economies of scale in terms of, you know, the ability for any organization, not just public sector, to have their own data center or server room or whatever it is and be able to bring the latest cyber technology defenses to that at all layers physical you know the different layers of infrastructure automatic reaction you know it's because look attack is reality it's about responding to it and knowing you're being attacked so look the cloud providers operate in the hundreds of billions if not more and they put a large percentage of that into cyber because it's in their business interest to make sure there is no issue um so look inherently it forces you to put it at the center and my, my point where i said secure by design look it's in all they're well architected to kind of there is good support from the cloud providers and partners like ourselves and frameworks to say right we've built and designed this solution before we even write a line of code does that stand up to these standards and it's kind of a well architected framework and part of that and a main pillar of that is security now, you still need the skill set, but I think this is where terms like DevSecOps and, you know, without getting into that whole area, um, it's no longer kind of, I build my solution as a developer and I'll hand it to the security or cyber team to see if it's secure. Actually, it's from conception right through, it's forced somewhat from the architecture and the infrastructure of cloud itself. And look, it, it has gone a shift from, you know, a few years ago, we'd be worried about talking about the, you know, is it secure to actually a couple of major cyber incidents in the last number of years, locally and abroad, I won't get into it in detail. Cloud has provided a big part of the solution, which is rather than securing what we have sensitive on-prem that's a bit weak, let's just take it and put it in the cloud. And if it's secure in the cloud, we're happy. So, you know, it, it isn't a right-click secure, but actually 
it's 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 by design you know unbelievable investment you have to get things right that comes back to that skills and policies perspective but you know that 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 narrative has definitely moved on and matured super thanks for it so we're we're coming up to the end of today's presentation um i would like to thank everybody victoria uh, rory ian and especially gavin who joined us today on his birthday so thanks very much gavin um, we will send out the uh, the deck uh, to all the attendees today and to everyone on the mailing list. If you have any questions or want to talk to any of us about cloud or robotics process automation and intelligent automation in, in the near future, please do uh, reach out to myself or Victoria. Um, thanks to everybody who joined today and gave us an hour of your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully see you all again soon.